Thank you for coming, everybody. I know it's always a strange feeling right before vacation. You want to sort of go, go, go. So thank you for coming to class. I appreciate it. And um, we'll start by setting our motivation. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings not be separated from happiness that is free of suffering. May they abide with equanimity, free from attachment, hatred, and indifference. So just warming those four measurables up in your mind. Okay. So um, today we're not going to review the Wednesday class on patience. Um, you're going to keep talking about it next this coming Wednesday. Um, and then we'll summarize it when I see you guys in person. So today we're going to look at joy and equanimity. Um, and we'll look at patience later. Okay. Okay. Yeah. They don't even you surprise them. You, you have to tell them that you're going to be here next week. <laughs> oh, surprise. <laughs> um, theoretically, I have a plane ticket. I'm going. I hope I don't die. If not, I see you. If I if, if I do die, thank you for the memories. It's been great. You, you, you can wait after the semester for that. Please, you have the rest of your life to do that. Please come first. <laughs> <laughs> so I will see you after Passover, I think. I hope it's all happening. Stay tuned. But, um, you know, anything could happen and they might stop me at any number of airports or you know who knows but theoretically so um my plan is that when i get back um to see you guys that we're gonna do just one whole class just on patience and kind of talk about the different angles because it's so important and it's um such a good support for love and compassion which you already have such great familiarity with from your life and your work but some of the things that block love and compassion are related to a lack of patience or some sort of cultivation of anger that's not been examined in, you know, maybe a, a Buddhist version that might be useful. So we'll do patience on its own uh, when I see you and then um, we'll shift to a different topic. So today is going to be our last day on the four immeasurables and then we're going to shift gears. So today we're just going to do uh, joy briefly and then equanimity and equanimity will keep getting like peppered through things because equanimity is such an important basis but the reason that um joy doesn't get a lot of discussion and even in your book it's only a couple of paragraphs joy is kind of reinforcing what was talked about with compassion and love the main difference is joy is really looking at the happiness and the causes of happiness that sentient beings already have right as opposed to like wanting them to have more of course it does want them to have more but it's looking at the way in which sentient beings are doing positive actions and the way in which they're experiencing the results of past positive actions so in the poly tradition rejoicing is much more about empathy and sympathy in the sanskrit tradition it's kind of more a proactive rejoicing in which then brings up a joy eventually so it's kind of a few different approaches um, in our tradition we talk about joy very much from the perspective of rejoicing yeah and this rejoicing is um, one of the quickest ways to stop jealousy and I think that um, jealousy is one of those negative states of mind that isn't talked about very much for adults. You know, like children have jealousy and, you know, in sports there's jealousy, but adults have huge amounts of jealousy that they don't talk about, like professional jealousy, for example. You might think that maybe one of your classmates is actually doing much better in their private practice financially than you, or they seem to attract more, um, I don't know, uh, interesting clientele, 
or their office space is more beautiful, or they're in a better part of town, or something that is like really nice, good news for them. But you're a little resentful because you think, why not me? You know, I'm a good person. I'm a professional person. Why don't I have a nice office in the nice part of town? Or why, you know, whatever. Use whatever example you like. But it almost is like the happiness of other people can ruin our happiness. When in fact, the happiness of other people could elevate our own happiness. So it's really looking at how can we view other people's success differently? And how can we view other people's progress on a spiritual path or depth in whatever ability they're cultivating as something so wonderful? And part of what makes it so wonderful is we realize how very difficult it is for things to come together. How very difficult it is for us to be positive, to work in an authentic way that's not forced. You know, for, for when we're actually filled with joy and well-being and peace, so many things had to come together for that state of mind. So then when we see it in someone else, we think, wow, many things had to come together for them to have that state of mind. You know, really, it's an amazing thing. So, you know, rejoicing is is something to really... I think try and look at it with a really objective mind because I don't know about you, but the first time I even heard that rejoicing was a practice in Buddhism, it felt really like maybe immature or childish. Like this is something you tell children to do, like be happy for your fellow classmates, you know, like be happy for people. Like it felt cheesy. It felt really um, American. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been in Australia too long, um, you know, so you're like, oh, I'm so happy for you. It can feel yucky. Do you know what I mean? And so what we're trying to do is like, okay, it can totally go that direction. And that is unbearable, yucky. We don't want to be a plastic person. But the practice is actually really profound that whenever you see someone else's success and happiness, you think, how wonderful. You don't think, why me? Why not me? Yeah. You don't think, how come they get the good things? I don't get the good things. You just think, how wonderful. It's actually really powerful. Um, you know, sometimes you'll see this with someone who has started making more effort to become physically fit, for example. And they are eating better and they're exercising more and they're looking just beautiful and gorgeous and handsome. And their friends are like, oh, you look amazing. But part of them is like, hmm. <laughs> you know, like annoyed. They're like annoyed that they're looking good. Yeah. Instead of just be like, oh, fantastic. Yeah. It takes a lot of effort to, you know, get into a routine. Well done. You know, <laughs> um, so if you can try and think of some examples in your life where instead of being happy for someone, you had resentment. You know, instead of appreciating the fact that they were doing well, you had jealousy. And to really examine what is the way to open the heart back up. And sometimes the easiest way is to preempt it with getting into the habit of noticing other people's happiness and success and consciously appreciating that. You know, how wonderful that is. Lama Zopa Rinpoche will even use his prayer beads and go, how wonderful it is, la la la. How wonderful it is, how wonderful it is. And he'll do like, as if it's a mantra of how wonderful it is that this organization does this good thing. How wonderful it is that these spiritual practitioners do this thing, et cetera, et cetera. And he makes it a real practice. So, um, something interesting to explore. I, I think that when you're doing the practice as a meditation, it starts with first yourself. And that is also a little bit embarrassing and like cringy, like why rejoice in your own stuff? That's, that's weird. But actually it makes you have more enthusiasm and more momentum. And 
so if you think how wonderful it is that you are doing this, 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 and this good thing, working for the greater good, let yourself touch that. Let yourself think that for a moment. Like we're all really working very hard in service of others. And yes, it's imperfect. And yes, it's inconsistent. And yes, many things support our ability to do so, but nevertheless, it gets done. And that is huge. You know, so just think it's really good that you guys are analysts. That's really a kind service to sentient beings. You're happy about your own stuff, but without pride. Yeah. So, um, so I'll show you a little bit of the breakdown here. So the rejoicing practice um, is an antidote to jealousy. It's a way to maximize merit. And this is maybe the most Buddhist component. And then it lifts and opens the heart. So it's said that when you rejoice in someone else's positive actions, you get good karma. Yeah, you get good karma by thinking of their good karma. And it's, it's almost like you can uh, grab the tail of someone else's virtue and be pulled into virtue as well. There's a lot of um, interesting psychology around why rejoicing gives you positive karma or maximizes your positive merit. And one of the things is it adds aspiration and inspiration. So if someone's doing really positive actions and you're not jealous and you're not resentful, you're just how wonderful it is, then there's part of you that might think, maybe I should do that, <laughs> you know? Maybe I should, um, I don't know, be kinder to my spouse, or maybe I should eat more healthy, or maybe I should go on a retreat, or maybe I should engage in this or that, and it really can inspire you. Um, you know, for a Buddhist practitioner, for example, we try and eliminate spiritual jealousy by really thinking about what other practitioners are doing and being so happy that they're able to do that actually creates the cause for us to be able to do that. I remembered um, knowing that people were doing a three month Vajrasattva retreat, which is a way to purify all the negative karma of one life as well as lots and lots of stuff from previous lives. It's an incredibly powerful practice, the three month Vajrasattva retreat. And I would hear so many of my friends do this retreat and the conditions were just not coming together for me to do it. You know, like I didn't have enough uh, financial support or I didn't have enough time in my schedule or whatever, whatever. But whenever I heard someone was doing a Vajrasattva retreat, I tried to really rejoice and think that is so wonderful. That's such a powerful practice. And it kind of gave me an inner momentum that when there was a tiny, tiny opportunity for me to squeeze in three months, I did it immediately without hesitation and it all came together. But if I hadn't been rejoicing all those years in other people's Vajrasattva retreat, maybe I would have hesitated or I would have waited and I might have missed the opportunity to do that virtue. Maybe. So it's just one example, but really letting yourself rejoice in others' positive actions can give you that spark, that kind of inspired feeling. So when um when you do the practice basically it goes in circles so you start with yourself and you rejoice in your own positive actions especially related to the spiritual path and then you expand it to just regular people in your life so you bring in equanimity ideas like you know looking at rejoicing in friends but also enemies relatives, coworkers, but just everyone in your life, consciously think about what they are doing well for the greater good. You know, for your enemies, for example, if you can think, well, they're terrible to work with, but they are kind to their mother. <laughs> That's something, right? Um, so you're consciously rejoicing in people you know, and then you expand it to strangers 
who are doing positive work, like charities and social services, various educators, um, meditators, or people that are engaged in spiritual study, um, but you really consciously expand it to strangers doing positive work. And then all sentient beings, you know, even the dodgy ones, try and think of the ones who are doing good, but then also everyone is doing good in some way, in some form. And then you expand it all the way out to rejoicing in Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and Gurus. And this is a way to really elevate the whole practice to think in the largest way of what is the best thing that we can be doing. It's to help people get themselves out of cyclic existence. It's to help people find the tools to perfect their minds and have stable happiness. And so the ones that are doing that in the most direct way are realized beings. Um, so do you have any questions about empathic joy or the rejoicing practice or just thoughts that come up? Does it make sense whether you agree or disagree with the practice? Does it sound clear enough? Duncan. Yeah. The jealousy itself, which is not a good thing. Sorry? Right? Say again. Jealousy, jealousy cannot take you to do the same action as you did with the uh, Vajra Sattva because you hear some, someone and you're jealous. And you hear the second one and you're jealous even more. And then you want this car like he does. He has a <laughs> And you want to too. Yeah, of course, jealousy can make you ambitious, right? Jealousy can give you all sorts of energy, of course. But do you want to be fueled by that? Or would you rather be fueled by joy and inspiration and aspiration and feeling connected to the people whose actions and resources you appreciate, then you're together with them as opposed to in competition with them. So of course you're quite right, you know, I mean, what fuels ambition? A lot of what fuels ambition is jealousy, but who wants to live that way? It's kind of like low, you know, it's kind of animal, it's kind of basic, it's like adolescent. Um, it works, but it also fuels dualism. You know, when you really think someone is doing a wonderful thing, it can make you examine what are the causes and conditions for that? Not how can I get it, but like, what are the things that have to come together for development? You know? So it's a, it's a very good point, you know, but I guess when we're on the spiritual path, we're always wanting to connect with the motivations that link us and make us feel more united with humanity, not the things that make us feel in dissonance or agitation or competition with humanity. Because, you know, the, what is the great ambition is the great enlightenment. So our work is not done until everyone is enlightened. So it's not a race because we all finish the goal at the same time when the last sentient being has become a Buddha, you know? So we're, you know, that's the work. It's all of our work. So also sometimes when someone is doing really, really well in their life, part of me thinks, oh good, I don't have to worry about them. Yeah, they're working towards enlightenment just fine without me, okay. Excellent, I'll worry about these other ones who are not doing so well on their path to enlightenment, you know? So it also feels like, ah, they're helping carry the project, <laughs> you know, the project of ending suffering. Yeah. And, you know, you think, thank goodness. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Last thing, last thing that you said, maybe uh, about a non-dualistic uh, view, very difficult to tell someone to uh, convince him that uh, 
jealousy is not productive, it's not, uh, it's low, it's not mature, like if you feel it. So maybe if you practice emptiness, then you won't feel dualistic, you won't be jealous. So if, if you practice a, a, a relationship, when you feel one with someone that he's with you, then you will not feel dualistic, then you won't but it looks very difficult for me to, uh, to, to practice logically. Why do I need uh, to rejoice? You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's a practice that I've had a lot of resistance to as well, because th there is something about it that feels cheesy or feels inauthentic emptiness always makes sense. Emptiness works for pretty much antidotes for every negative state of mind. But I think when when I'm getting myself really genuinely connected to rejoicing, it's because I remember what a lift it gives my heart when I'm actually in that resonance. So sometimes it's translated as empathic joy, which is not like enmeshed or codependent joy it's like you know when you see your children doing well like you see like see say you have a, a new baby and they're like two years old and you see them share their toy with another child like aren't you so happy if you see your little one sharing a toy you think oh there's hope for humanity, you know, and then you see the other child like share their toy or they're like feeding each other snacks like that joy. You know, where you're so happy to see someone else doing virtue. We it's hard for us to have that with our peers. But I think all of us know that feeling when we see children being kind to each other, how just like deeply happy it makes us. Do you know what I mean, that feeling? Yeah, or like even maybe your pets, you see your pets being nice to each other and like curled up in the little pet bed together and like all snuggly and cute. And you think, oh, they're being kind to each other. They're not fighting, that's so beautiful. Yeah, there's something that really um, softens and deepens your heart about living in this way that notices people's virtue that notices people's positive actions and that deep rejoicing it's it's a quiet deep peace but it's a very happy mind when you're in it so when you're in that rejoicing headspace there's no room for jealousy like it doesn't have an opportunity to come in and take your peace jealousy is very uncomfortable because you're always comparing you know, you're like, am I better than them or better than them? Oh, well, in this group, at least I'm better than those ones. You know, those ones, I don't know, they're they're creeping up on my heels. They could be better than me, but I think I'm better than them in this way. I'm smarter, at least. I'm more beautiful. I'm more rich. My relationships are healthier. My professional affect is more intact. Whatever nonsense that jealousy does to us, it's agitated. And that agitated mind is not a happy mind. So whether you're reminding yourself of how nice it is to be an empathic joy, or you're reminding yourself of how uncomfortable it is when you're really in jealousy, those two thoughts, one of those, can kind of help you do the practice of rejoicing. But if they don't work, you can go straight to the logic of emptiness. That works very well. So it's very personal. But if you can at least like use your memory to touch when you've had some sort of flavor of empathic joy in your past to remind yourself of just how like lovely a space that is and then how easy it is to kind of expand it and radiate it. And it's just so much easier to be creative and kind when you are content. And one way to get contentment is to not be jealous. Does, does the logic make more sense or do you feel gaps? I think 
there is another depth that I understood now that you explained it more. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you guys are asking. And it's, you know, it's different than how the world teaches us to be, you know, the world teaches us to be ambitious and competitive and, you know, but I think there's a, there's a difference between like healthy, joyful competitiveness and like deep envy, jealousy, agitation, you know, like if you're like playing sports with your friends on a weekend, you want to win, but you're also happy if you lose because you're just playing, you know, but it's like if too much competitiveness gets in it, then if you win, you're sort of self satisfied and smug, but also worried about losing your position. And if you lose, you're full of self loathing and angst and why can't I ever and it's like a whole story and it's not play anymore. So it's not like there's no forms of competitiveness that aren't useful or playful. I mean, monks and nuns in the nunnery and monasteries debate and someone wins the debate, but you might win the debate one day and lose the debate the next day. And it's all just the play of ideas. So if ego gets too involved, it suffocates the joy of it. But it's not to say you can't have that kind of dynamic push and pull and play with people. It's just keeping an equanimity and an evenness underneath. The other thing maybe that I understood now that we are, we do hear in our culture the importance of giving good feedback, positive feedback. You're pointing to another thing, to an inner state of mm -hmm. really rejoicing which is a, something that you need to stay and let it, how do you say? Yeah. And then you see what will get out of your mouth, right? But first. Yeah, yeah, sometimes like we're trained to validate, you know, say words of praise and support before we're taught how to rejoice. But if you rejoice, then like spontaneously, you validate and praise in a way that is really heart centered, and feels true, rather than like sometimes validation and praise are lovely and supportive. But sometimes they feel really condescending and like really patronizing like someone's like, Oh, you're a good girl, you know, like it feels really like looking down. Yeah, it's like, Oh, um, but if someone is coming from a, I'm just genuinely happy you did that. That's really coming from their heart, then whatever they say from their mouth lands much differently because it's real. It's not them telling themselves, oh, I should validate because that's a helpful thing to do. It feels totally different. And feedback is such an interesting thing, isn't it? Because sometimes feedback is so necessary to know if something has been useful or not, to know if you should continue or not. But then sometimes you become addicted to feedback and you don't know if things are useful using your own common sense you know, and you start chasing validation. So this practice of start with yourself, I think is quite interesting of really consciously going through your day and thinking, no one but me knows this, but in traffic, I could have really lost my patience. And today I kept it together. No one knows but me, but that is worth celebrating, you know? Or you talked on the phone with your mother and she said some triggering thing that she always says. And today you responded with kindness rather than reactivity. No one knows that but you because there was no conflict to recover from. But you know that and that's worth celebrating. You know, it's just these like quiet victories over your own negative states of mind, you know, con conquering your delusions because they're the only actual enemy. Thoughts, us not, Dorit, being naughty kids in the back, what do you want, what are you saying? Practicing patience towards your mother. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> universal, universal problem. 
<laughs> so is, does that feel clear enough the joy one are you ready for equanimity or did you want to ask anything else about immeasurable joy you just want to remind the group that the quote uh, inserts the word joy as uh, contradictory to pleasure and satisfaction which are mostly grandiose uh, expression of the personality while the joy was uh, almost in the status of the sixth transformation together with the courage uh, so i think that this is something which we can see the parallel process of uh, uplifting the personal private <coughs> egoistic uh, funds and pleasures and the satisfactions in life uh, in order to transcend to other layers of uh, of becoming uh, happy and uh, this is something that we can say uh, together with the buddhist uh, perspective yeah and and the word satisfaction in english is problematic because it can have that very egocentric connotation of like self-satisfied smug arrogant kind of happy ish but like you know really egocentric but satisfaction can also mean content you know it can also mean grounded and stable with what is i'm satisfied i don't need anything else so it can have two connotations that are very different from each other um just a note about english yeah so um equanimity and equanimity has come up many times but today we're going to kind of go through it specifically so equanimity in the immeasurable sense so it is a word we use all the all over the place right but in the immeasurable sense is impartial unbiased goodwill for all sentient beings regardless of the labels we attribute to them like friend enemy and stranger and so there are many approaches to developing immeasurable equanimity but the first one is to remember equality okay so, so it's important to understand that equanimity is not about being neutral. When we use the word equanimity in a meditation context, it's about not being reactive to whatever thoughts are arising. It's about not chasing at different distractions. Equanimity as a practice in meditation is not the same thing as immeasurable equanimity. So the mental factor of equanimity also is not the same thing. So this word gets used all over the place. And sometimes it does mean kind of just rest in peace or rest in non-reactivity or stay neutral. But that's not what it means in this context. In this context, it's a very active goodwill. It's a very warm attitude. And it acknowledges that we put people into categories. It's not pretending that we don't put people into categories. It's just saying that those categories are not the reason for my goodwill. So if you're my enemy, may you be well and happy. If you're a stranger, may you be well and happy. If you're my friend, may you be well and happy. You can be in any of those categories and my goodwill can be the same. <clears throat> so it's about the mentality that you're bringing to relationship rather than, um, I don't know, like a gift you give people who you like, the ones you like get the love, the ones you don't like don't get the love because they don't deserve it or something. It's like everybody is equal in wanting happiness and not wanting suffering everyone is equal in needing happiness and not having suffering. So let's elevate. Um, so when we were talking about this with cohort one, back when they were doing this semester, I remember um, a conversation we had where it sounded as if everyone was making equanimity sound like now all people are the same kind of blandness like everyone has become beige yeah or gray 
And what equanimity is saying is there is red and there is blue and there is green. And I like red, blue, and green, but red, blue, and green are not the same color, but I like them all. <laughs> so it's having some sort of like affection, even if you actually don't have rapport. And do you guys know what I mean by rapport? I don't know if that's a common word in English for you guys to use, but like affinity and connection. You don't have to have the same level of rapport with all sentient beings. Some of them, huh? Yes, as we said, but it's rapport in Hebrew. We use the same word. Oh, cool. That's handy. Okay. <laughs> so you don't have to have the same rapport to have the same affection. And that's kind of the revolutionary idea is that we're used to thinking if I speak with you easily, if I connect with you easily, if you are easy to be with, that means you can have my affection. And equanimity is saying you can have my affection, whether it's easy to be with you or not, whether we connect immediately or not, may you be well, may you be happy. <laughs> so, so there's a few ways to think your way into this. Um, so the first one being remember equality, the ways in which we're equal. So we're equal with drives. We want happiness, not suffering. We're equal in that our view is problematic. We all have the view, which is the innate self grasping ignorance. We all have this problematic way of projecting. We're also all equal from potential. So our potential is all equal in that we all have Buddha nature. We all have the ability to evolve. And we're equal in the fact that the nature of our mind is clear and knowing in the sense of reflective and able to know its objects. And the stains or the negative states of mind or the problematic habits are adventitious, meaning additional or extra they don't enter into the essence of the mind. So this is true of every single sentient being. So you kind of sit with, okay, my innate ignorance has built any number of preferences. That's something to know, but actually all of us have an equal status. And that's something to kind of hold. And then we build on that idea of equal status and we shift to looking at the fact of impermanence. And this one can be the most powerful one for equanimity, I think. So you remember that relationships change and the people involved in them. That labels change and the meaning of labels. And the experience of closeness and distance change and how much of each we want. So you take one person in your life as the example a close friend, take your close friend and imagine that you spend one whole day together, just one day. And it's a day off and you're gonna have a number of meals and coffee and some sort of entertaining event together. And you have a plan for your day. And within one day with one person, they can be friend, enemy, stranger, friend, enemy, stranger, many times throughout the day. You brand them friend the whole time. But you know, you're walking together, you know, on the boardwalk in Tel Aviv, going for coffee, and they say, I want to go to this place. And you say, I want to go to this place. Now there is dissonance. And there's a moment where you feel distant or you start talking about politics and you assume that you're on the same page. And then someone has this opinion about, I don't know, Russia and Ukraine, and you have this opinion about Russia and Ukraine, and suddenly there's distance. Or you talk about politics and you realize you're more the same than you thought, now you feel close. Or you're walking along together and you have totally different observations. One of you is looking at the sea 
one of you is looking at the people and you can't understand why the other is focused on what they're focused on and you feel kind of like strangers for a minute one day with one person is not one relationship you know they're all these chapters and it's ebbing and flowing all the time and one you know 20 year long friendship can end with one terrible argument and someone that you've felt an enemy for 20 years can be resolved in one powerful conversation so we're trying to remember that all relationships are in flux which is self-evident which is very obvious which is your work but just to like consciously remember everything is changing in all relationships a stranger just has to speak to you kindly and start to you know share some things immediately friend or they start to say something critical or do something unpleasant immediately enemy you know and the thing is is that nothing has really changed fundamentally from the side of the person it's your mental attitude towards them and whether you have branded them as beneficial or not so of course bodhisattvas try to brand everyone as beneficial and then they feel a natural warmth very easily you think enemies are essential for my development if i didn't have difficult people I wouldn't have anything to come up against and to reflect on and to be a mirror for myself. I would have to just rely on my own memories and my own kind of day to day self awareness. But with an actual harm giver, I can see how conditional my love and compassion are. I need enemies. So they are greatly beneficial to me. So I feel warmth towards them. Yeah, in theory, right? This is what bodhisattvas are trying to do, right? Or for bodhisattvas, it's not so much effort. For us, we're trying to. And, you know, and for strangers, you think eh, almost everything we use in our life came from strangers, like our car and the road and the building we're in and the clothes that we're wearing and the food that we eat is from the work of strangers. So how can we be indifferent to strangers? We owe them everything. Yeah. And then you think friends, well, friends, it's so easy to get attached to friends. So try to break the spell of attachment by remembering what's not so great about them. <laughs> yeah. So you're not remembering what's not so great about the enemy because that's already too much highlighted. You've already put the spotlight on that. But for friends, you try to remember the negative in order to balance yourself to release attachment. So you could think, with this one friend, I am much more likely to, what? Drink too much, <laughs> gossip too much, drive too fast, make poor choices. So it's nice to be with them, but it's not all good that we're together. Because when I'm with them, I'm actually lowering my conversation. Yeah, or you could think this is a wonderful, kind person who I will always want in my life. However, <laughs> they have this problematic behavior and that problematic behavior, which has always been an issue for us. And I need to kind of remember that it exists so I don't get so attached. So you're not trying to like go into neutral. You're just trying to go into love that is clean and clear. So equanimity is about returning to love, returning to compassion. It's not returning to neutral. Are you with me? So it's vital because if we don't have stable equanimity, our love, compassion, and joy are unstable. Yeah, they're going to be biased. They're going to be preferential. If we don't understand how vital and how true an equanimous state of mind is, everything else is very uh, weak. Yeah, 
because then you're only kind to your friends while you've labeled them friend. And, it, you know, you can go back again in your memories and think about maybe someone in your life who used to be your friend, who you maybe had some falling out, some argument, or maybe you just drifted apart, but there was enough love there, enough love, that if you saw them years later and they said, I need your help, you would immediately help them even though you're not friends anymore, even though the relationship has fallen away, if there was enough love, you would still immediately help them. You know, there's maybe some people in your life like that, right? And I think it's helpful to remember that because that shows that the relationship ran its course, but you had enough love that it actually was a healthy thing, or at least had aspects of health to it because we don't understand all the mechanisms of karma. Karma is extremely hidden because of how incredibly detailed it is. If I was to say, what are all of the conditions for this one cup? We couldn't finish the list. Yeah, where did all of the pieces of porcelain come from? Where did all of the atoms of paint, where have all of the creation of this design? Where did, where did, where did, one cup we couldn't list all of the conditions and causes let alone one person or one relationship it's extremely complex all of the things that came together so if you're remembering that some relationships just finish the karma finishes and it doesn't have to be anyone's fault yeah it just ran out of gas like a car then you can have a little bit more space with, nevertheless, I'll maintain my goodwill. And actually all of these strangers in the world are people I used to know. Yeah, in past lives. These are all people I used to know. You know, you're driving in traffic, looking at all the people in the cars. These used to be my best friends. These used to be my family. These used to be my spouse. These used to be my children. And I don't remember anymore. The karma finished, the relationship finished, lifetimes changed and shifted. But if you can kind of remember that human beings are vitally important for our happiness, but the specific human beings are not. Right? We are social animals. We need each other. We, we exist in a kind of herd or a pack. We need other human beings, but we get very attached to specific ones as if they intrinsically inject us with happiness and well being. And that's not true. Yeah. But if you give them all of the power for that, then if they die or leave or the relationship changes, the grief is unbearable. But it's not like someone leaving your life has to be giving you grief. It only gives you grief because of how much loading and attachment you put on it. So conversations about the relationship between grief and attachment are not conversations to have with someone who is having terrible grief, right? That's insensitive, that's not compassionate. But for us objectively to look at with ourselves, it's incredibly empowering to realize that grief and loss don't actually have to be together. There could just be loss. Yeah, the pain is attachment not getting what it wants. The attachment that says, I needed you for a special kind of happiness, which shows that we actually kind of objectified the person we made them into an object for our pleasure rather than as a sentient being who deserves our care. So it's human, it's natural to experience grief, but to really take a little step back and ask ourselves, how much does attachment play a part in grief? Yeah. And do I need to have the same grief the next time someone leaves my life? because everyone is going to leave your life or you're going to leave theirs, right? Either through just changes or death. 
So if you're kind of getting into that lack of equanimity of I'll be fine if I have this, this, and this person. If I have these three people, I'll be fine. But if I lose any of those three people, my life is over. Then you've disempowered yourself and ruined the potentials for all sorts of dynamic relationships and all sorts of happiness. So equanimity frees you up to love more people. Equanimity frees you up to feel related and connected to more people. Yeah, and on the basis of equanimity, the people already in your life, you can love much more deeply, much more effectively. So remembering impermanence really helps. Also remembering benefit really helps, that there's a way to view friends, enemies, and strangers as beneficial or otherwise, kind of evens it out. And then the other one is projection, which you guys talk about all the time in psychology, but to realize that the conceptions of friend, enemy, and stranger come from us, not from them. Otherwise, everyone would like or dislike others identically. The concepts of friend, enemy, and stranger don't exist inherently. Otherwise, they would have a natural label before you met them or the label couldn't change. So this is very clear intellectually, but not so much experientially. So again, you can think about something like maybe a close friend who's having a disagreement with another one of your friends. When your close friend is in conflict with another one of your friends, and you're just kind of the third party observing it, you might think, oh, well, if they only knew, if they only knew the situation, they would forgive you. If they only knew, they would be more patient. If they knew you like I knew you, they would love you too, right? But this shows the way everything is contextual because you, know, you take one person in isolation, just one person, some, to someone, they are their most important person. To someone else, they are indifferent to them. And then there's someone else who really doesn't like them. And just the sight of them is annoying. You know, so one person is a condition for pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral feelings. If they were inherently as they are, everyone would respond to them exactly the same. And we know that's not the case. So you just kind of like use your analytical abilities to walk around all the edges of what a person means to you and try and get some more air and movement in there. And, you know, just even thinking the person in your life who's very difficult, who annoys you, who irritates you, there is someone in their life or in their past who love them so much who benefited from them so much, even if it was only their dog, right? But there was someone who the sight of this enemy just made them so happy. But for you, you can't stand the sight of them. And you think that's inherently the case, right? So equanimity is very much fueled by remembering the emptiness of inherent existence, or at the very least, remembering surface projections that we do. Yeah, that we brand people friend, enemy, and stranger based on whether we think they're beneficial to us or things that we value. And that's a pretty small view, right? It makes sense, but it's not the whole picture. Yeah, so um, thoughts about equanimity or questions? Um, anything from the past either, because this concept comes up a lot. Does it feel important to have equanimity or is there part of you that has resistance and thinks, well, if I have equanimity, then no one gets to be special and I have to have special people? Or I don't know, what other objections come up? Oh, the, the... The objection uh, in these days is uh, uh, towards the uh, terrorists. It's uh, mm. 
difficult to be with the community to become more big life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so the terrorist is a difficult case and I'm with you, but like, use something that's similarly problematic, but maybe not so triggering. Have you ever seen a documentary about a serial killer? Yes, yeah, serial killers. You have serial killers in, in Israel. No, only terrorists, but do you <laughs> just like men, right? <laughs> yeah, you have serial killers in Israel. I'm sure you do. Um, <laughs> um, if you ever watched a documentary about a serial killer, like um, in America, you know, they're very famous. Um, you always hear similar stories of terrible abuse in their childhood, right? Always. Probably some traumatic brain injury or something that was genetically tricky about their brain. So either their brain was difficult from birth or they had an injury. And then they came into contact with the ideas that led them to becoming a serial killer. So there was some sort of perfect storm, right? Of trauma, injury, or genetic issues and opportunity. And that what, that's what makes a serial killer, right? In any culture, in any time, those things. And when you watch these documentaries, you think, oh my goodness, if I had had that family, if I had had that brain trauma, if I had had those opportunities, I still would never do those things. I can't understand how people are like that, right? We feel very separate and kind of superior. You know, we think, oh, maybe I would be depressed or maybe I'd be anxious, but I wouldn't be a terrorist or I wouldn't be a serial killer. Yeah, we feel a little bit distant. But if you really listen deeply to the stories of people who have done terrible things, if you listen with a mind of equanimity, eventually some compassion arises where you realize, yes, but for them, it's almost as if they had no choice. Given all of the conditions that came together, the idea that killing one person or many people to vent their suffering or to show their sadness or to show their rage felt logical. And that we, if we had had the same exact lifetime, the same exact genetics, the same series of lifetimes, we would have made those same choices. And so to be able to see the terrorist within yourself or to see the serial killer within yourself or the rapist or the pedophile or the animal abuser is something none of us want to do because none of us would do those things now as we are but from a buddhist perspective we've been as bad as hitler all of us and to think otherwise would be to not understand the human condition we've also been amazing philanthropists and created utopian societies that were full of harmony and love and music and art we've done everything again and again from beginningless time and none of it has yet led to our awakening because we haven't overcome attachment, anger, and ignorance. So the way it looks is different person to person, but all of us have the same ingredients, the same poisons that could lead to someone being a terrorist or a serial killer. So just kind of sit with it. You don't have to agree, but give yourself some space from disagreeing and just let it brew. Yeah, and we can talk about it after Passover. So I hope you guys have a nice holiday and uh, we'll go ahead and dedicate. All sentient beings who although self and all appearances are dharmadhatu by nature have not realized it thus. I shall endow with happiness and the causes of happiness. I shall separate from suffering and the causes of suffering. I shall make inseparable from happiness without suffering. And I shall set in equanimity the cause of well being, free from attachment, aversion, and partiality. Okay. 
So um, the reading on joy and equanimity is quite brief. Um, so have a little look at that. And um, for your Wednesday class, try to finish chapter 13 about patience. Thanks, folks. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.